Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Maine Castillo. I'm Town Hall's Program Manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle, PCC Community Markets, and our friends at Third Place Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation with artist Lauren Coe and social entrepreneur Emily Kim. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Lauren and Emily for appearing tonight to help make that possible. Town Hall will be taking a short break this winter, but if you're looking for us, we are always online. You can check out many of our past talks available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. Town Hall has been put under significant strain due to the ever-changing landscape. We hope you will consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking on the link to donate on your screen or becoming a member. Our partner booksellers have been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak as well and can use your support. If you are interested in purchasing a copy of the book being presented this evening, please use the link on this live stream page to go through Third Place Books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following today's broadcast. The presentation will be about 60 minutes, including Q&A. Questions will be sele selected from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. So please submit those at any time. We will also take questions from the YouTube chat. We cannot guarantee that we will be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and Wincoat Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. Lauren Co. is an artist, writer, self-taught home baker, and founder of the popular Instagram account, Loco Kitchen. Her work has been featured in publications such as Vogue. O Magazine, BuzzFeed's Tasty, and on screen in Martha Bakes. Her iconic signature spoke design has been dubbed the Modern Lattice. Originally from San Diego, Lauren currently lives here in Seattle, Washington with her partner and their bear dog. Emily Kim is co-founder of The Pastry Project, a social enterprise that provides free baking and pastry training to individuals with barriers to opportunity and a learning space for all. Her community impact focus at The Pastry Project brings her love of pastry and social impact together, putting skills from her time in public policy at Seattle City Council and social impact and marketing at Molly Moons to work. Co's book, Pyometry, is the subject of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Emily Kim and Lauren Co. Yay! Hello! <laughs> Hello! So I'm so excited that I get to interview you tonight and ask you all the questions about your career and your new book, um, which I have right here. And I have yeah, I'm so here. excited we get to talk together. Um, and just for the record, I'm not wearing a pajama top. It's a fun Fetty sweater, but my camera is so bad that it looks like I'm just lounging around. But really happy to be here and excited to chat. Yay. Okay, so um, I wanted to start with um, just kind of an introductory thing because I don't know how much everyone knows about you and how you started, but um, you have a pretty traditional or non-traditional background <laughs> when it comes to baking and pie making. And um, I just kind of wanted to ask you what kind of your career before this was and then how you started um, your Instagram account and how we got here. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's quite the winding path. Um, my professional background is in social work and nonprofit administration. Um, and when I started my local kitchen Instagram account, I was the executive assistant to the chancellor at Seattle colleges. Um, and then this subsequently blew up and now I make pie for a living. So uh, kind of a circuitous kind of professional route to get here um, in terms of how I started making pie and how Loco Kitchen came to be. It was also kind of an accident or a fluke. Uh, I like to say that I grew up in a family of phenomenal eaters. 
So had the great gift of being surrounded by food, surrounded by people who appreciated food, surrounded by people who were making delicious food. Um, but I come from a Chinese, Honduran, American family. So not a lot of traditional apple pie happening. Um, and so, you know, I was cooking and baking growing up and, you know, for fun and to feed myself as an adult, but somehow I had never made a pie. So when my partner and I moved to Seattle four years ago, I was looking for a job in, you know, the nonprofit sector and had some extra time on my hands and was messing around on the internet as one does. Uh, and I just happened to stumble across these really beautiful pictures of pie on Pinterest. And they made me think, huh, I've never made one. I wonder if I could do that and just went for it. Uh, and I made my first app, uh, plaid lattice apple pie and it was fine. Didn't change my life. I didn't instantly transform into a pie lady. It was just something that I added to my repertoire of things that I was baking for fun on the weekends or weeknights. Um, and then a year later, so a year after my, I made my first pie, I started my local kitchen Instagram account. And that was solely because I felt like I was becoming that friend and putting too many food photos in my personal account mm -hmm. um, and just didn't want to be too obnoxious about it. And I thought I am just going to have this separate holding place of you know, photos of things that I'm just making for fun. Um, and it was, you know, meant to be a catch all. So I was thinking summer salads and blueberry muffins and fun cookies. Uh, but it just so happened that the first photo I shared was a geometric peach pie with a pun for a caption. Um, and that got something like five or 600 likes almost immediately, which as a regular person totally blew my mind. Um, and so a few days later, I thought that I would try to post a, a tart photo and see if, you know, that first post was a total fluke or if something was happening here. Um, and again, that got several hundred likes. It's just kind of like, oh, what's happening? I had, you know, maybe a hundred followers. It was probably my family and, you know, old high school friends that I hadn't talked to in many years. Um, so I just kind of kept posting pies and tarts. Uh, if you look at my feed closely, you'll notice that every other post is a pie and every other post is a tart. I don't think I noticed that. That's crazy. Um, and it just like, I, I don't think that was an intentional decision. Like I'm only going to post pies and tarts, but that just happened. And to this day, I am still doing that. So basically I started my Instagram account August of 2017 a month in, I had hit a thousand followers, which again, as a regular person was like totally weird and wild. Um, and by that December, I had hit a hundred thousand followers. And by January of 2018, I had quit my job to kind of see where this would lead. Um, and uh, three years later, a little over three years later, here we are. I just came out with my first book and, uh, and I'm still making play. That is so fun. And I did go back and like, I found that first peach pie picture, which is really fun because yeah, that was what started it all. Totally um, crazy. And okay, you did mention this a little bit. So your first caption had a pun and I did want to ask you because basically puns are like a part of like most of your captions, if not all of them, and a huge part of the book as I was reading through it. And um, I just wanted to know if you just, loved puns or was it like that first caption and then you just kind of kept going with it or like yeah a little bit more about how puns are a part of everything yeah I mean I think that's another one of a, another part of this journey that was just kind of like I it just happened and then I kept going in that vein and here we are so I don't think I'm like naturally funny I think people meet me in person and expect me to be some sort of stand-up comic but I actually have to work really hard at writing these captions um, and sometimes I spend as much time on the captions as I do on the pies, but it just so happened that that first one was a pun. And um, I, you know, I think I wanted to kind of capture people's interest, both in the vid visual image of the photos that I was sharing, but also in the captions. Um, I think just personally as, as a consumer on social media, I always knew that I felt more interested and more engaged when, you know, there were but lots of interesting things happening 
Um, and I think once I kind of kept including puns in the captions, I got some pretty great responses from people saying came for the pie, stayed for the pun. So um, I think it's just kind of become a part of the local kitchen voice. And so I knew I had to um, obviously include some or more than some in my book. Cool. Um, okay, you also mentioned about your cultural background, which I think is really interesting um, as well. And um, you kind of have this sub series called um, My American Pie. And so I wanted to know a little bit more about how that series started and um, maybe what your favorite story from that um, is. Yeah. Um, so the ad agency BBDO, they're based in New York. They reached out to me. They have a like creative residency or a creative lab called the Residency NYC. Um, and basically they kind of channel resources into fun projects for them as they partner with, you know, artists and creatives all around the country. Um, and they reached out and we got to brainstorm a few ideas of things that maybe we could create together um, and landed on this idea of My American Pie. I think at the time, you know, public discourse was, you know, there was a lot of conversation about you know, immigration and citizenship and, you know, what it means to be American, who gets to decide that. Um, and we just felt like this could be a really good medium for having that conversation in a, in a different way. Um, and so for those who don't know, it was the series where we got to feature um, a couple individuals or even a family um, and we let them tell their story in their own words of what being American means to them, what their heritage is. And then I got to create a pie inspired by their story. Um, and we got to share them in tandem with their portraits. Um, and it was such a cool partnership and a really cool series that we got to kick off with me telling my own story. Um, and that was uh, felt like a pretty wild experience because, you know, I, I make pie art and I don't share a lot of you know my face or you know personal details on my account and that was kind of the first time that I got to share about you know my family my dad is from Hong Kong my mom was born and raised in Honduras um, and just the response that we got in in response to that post was pretty crazy I think something like 40,000 likes and thousands and thousands of comments and almost all of them were positive, which she, as we all know, any space on the internet rarely sees that kind of um, positivity. So it was just really cool to be able to, one, share my story and also um, kind of get the feedback from people saying like, I totally identify or as they read some of these other stories that we got to share, um, hear from people saying it kind of broadened their um, view of, you know, kind of people's stories and what a wide range um, people are coming from. So uh, it was a really cool series to be part of. And I'm so glad that um, the people that we worked with were willing to share their stories and share their portraits with us. Cool. Yeah, I loved reading those stories. And I thought it was so fun and creative to do it through Pi. Um, okay, so I want to ask you now just about um, your pie designs and your tart designs. And um, I have your book here, uh, and it has your signature spoke design on the front. And I just wanted to know um, how you came up with with that kind of like when you came up with that, and um, and how you came up with that design because I see it everywhere, and I see so many people love recreating it. I see it like all mm -hmm. over the internet. Feel like so yeah it's so crazy um so i posted that in september of 2017 so just a couple weeks after i started my instagram account and you know i don't really remember it it wasn't like an intentional thing of i'm going to create something really cool it was just like oh i'm going to make a pie um what's my next design and i think i kind of naturally gravitate towards a lot of modern design or geometric designs or things kind of constructed of straight lines because that seems easy. You just cut the dough in strips and then construct it. Um, and I think I, for this one, I was inspired by those kind of string art puzzles that we played with as children or I played with um, as a child growing up. Um, and yeah, it's pretty wild to me that something that started in my little home kitchen as like, oh, this is 
just a cool design that I came up with that has now launched out into the world. I've seen professional chefs make it in their restaurants. I've seen other fellow home bakers um, make it in their own home kitchens. And basically people all over the world have recreated this design. And um, yeah, I think every day it's still mind boggling to me that this little pie has become the sort of modern lattice and has launched out and even landed a spot on the cover of my book. So cool. Yeah, I saw you teaching Ellen Bennett the other day. And a fun <laughs> fact I learned from it was that you were saying that you can pour like an ex like extra juice or like caramel or something in the little hole. And I was like, oh, that's so genius. Yeah, so the cover uh, pie is made with blueberries and rhubarb, but sometimes I will make it with pear and apple and like mix in some caramel. And then when it comes out hot, that center opening is like an extra portal for pouring in extra caramel. So genius. Fun treat. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you had um, an, like a second favorite or I don't even know if that was your favorite or if it just made it on the cover, but um, if there was a runner up like cover shot, I wanted to show you my favorite one. I don't know why I just love it. I really like that one. Oh yeah. There's just That's like pretty. a lot of color and movement and texture in there. Um, let me think. I think maybe that uh, pie that I made for the My American Pie series for my story, um, I don't know that there's anything like wildly striking about the design, but I think it's both pairing it with the story and then kind of getting that huge response has made it really meaningful. Cool. Um, yeah, let's see. Oh, I, I was just curious. So like now I have all these kind of just random questions. Um, which design has taken you the longest? Or like what takes the longest? Um, I think some of the really intricate woven designs are the ones that take the longest, especially if I'm making pie in the summer because it's just like warm. The environment is warm. And so um, I do all my weaving on parchment paper, which I highly recommend. And I talk about in my book because you can just slide a baking sheet under that parchment and pop your dough in the fridge. Um, so if it starts to get warm and squishy, you can just chill it down for a few minutes, bring it back out, um, which is really nice, but also can kind of lengthen that process of of making that pie top. So I think probably the woven ones, just for being a little bit more complicated and a little more time intensive. Um, yeah, they take longer, but not necessarily like more skill or more technique. It's just purely time. And then do you have any kind of like funny or behind the scenes or like happy accident type of situations that happened with any of your pies that you can think of? <laughs> um, I don't know about happy accidents. I know that I've had my share of disasters or what I call pie disasters. Uh, the biggest one was when I had just started making pies. Uh, that Thanksgiving, I was all like cocky and um, confident. And I made this Marion berry pie and had this really intricate geometric lattice on top. And I was so proud of it. But unbeknownst to me, I had severely underbaked it. Um, and we took it to my in-laws for Thanksgiving. And of course, in this like Asian family, it's the only dessert for that dinner. Uh, and on our travels to Portland, it spilled basically all over the backseat. It looked like a crime scene bloody berry juice everywhere. Um, and we get to my in-laws house. I try to like put it back in the oven and rebake it as if that's how it works. <laughs> uh, it didn't work. And I had to sit there mortified and watch everybody eat it because they were so nice and insisted on like cutting slices, which was really, really kind of them, but also extremely embarrassing. So I swore off pie making after that. Uh, at least for a couple of months, but fortunately, somehow I kind of got back into it, and here we are now. We have to redeem a ourselves. Funny story that we yeah. can tell. Um. Oh, I noticed that you have like all of these illustrations and like fun. Oh, like, yeah. Pies. And I was wondering if you like often sketch out your pies before you do them, or whether this was just for the book. Yeah, I get that question a lot. And actually, I pretty much never sketch things out beforehand. I find that that actually frustrates me more where 
I flesh out this idea with pen and paper and pencil. Um, and then I try to execute it with dough and fruit, which don't always cooperate in the same way. So I actually prefer to scroll through my Pinterest boards or kind of think through some previous ideas that I've had um, and maybe pick one particular concept and have a direction that I'm heading in. Um, and then I just go for it. So I just wing it. And basically what you see in my Instagram feed, um, any particular post is just the result of that particular creative session. Um, for the book, it was kind of my reward once I you know, finalized a recipe, had tested it multiple times, had the design set, then I got to sit down, sketch it out. And really that was kind of to put it all up on the wall to have a more macro view of um, all the pies and um, tarts and designs that I had developed for the book so that I had would have a balance of, um, you know, different designs, colors, flavors, things like that. So um, it was pretty, it was really cool to kind of see that wall come together. And I'm still really excited that they, that those sketches made it in the book. Yeah, it was really cool. Speaking of walls, don't your parents have like all of your frame, <laughs> like it wasn't sketches, it was the actual pies, right? Oh, yeah, it's a little embarrassing. Wall. It's really sweet. They, my dad one day emailed me, he's like, can you send me, you know, like 30 of your favorite photos from your Instagram? I was like, sure. And um, they printed them out on like little canvases and mounted them on their dining room wall after they remodeled their house. Cute. So it's really sweet, but it's like really weird for me to go visit and be like, oh, <laughs> it's like a small shrine. <laughs> Very strange. Um, oh, speaking of, okay, just like inspiration and things, um, how do you find inspiration for all of this stuff? Like, yeah, I mean, I was just trying to trying to think of what you might think about, like current trends or uh, <laughs> Pinterest a lot, like what you did in the beginning. And yeah, how do you kind of find inspiration for? Yeah, I think it's the answer is two parts. First one is just anything, everywhere, all the things. Um, I take inspiration from basically the world around me. So in terms of design, I'm inspired by things like architecture, textiles, uh, furniture, um, geometric puzzles, that kind of thing. I have uh, pies and tarts in my book and in my feed inspired by um, lawn chairs, public restroom floors, storm drains, bamboo purses, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it's also like what I make is also driven by seasonal produce. So what's available at the store or more likely what's on sale at the grocery store or what I have on hand. So if I have a ton of apples, I'm probably going to make an apple pie, but also, you know, kind of look around and find ways to add a special twist or, you know, make it different. Um, but a lot of the times it's just kind of, what do I have in my fridge? What do I have in my pantry? Um, and then kind of building from there, what kinds of you know, let's say I have a bunch of mangoes, what are some fruits that color contrast really well with them? Um, what are other flavors that pair well and complement? So that's that's sometimes how I build, um, you know, any particular pie or tart. Cool. And speaking of produce and um, seasonal fruits and vegetables, you use, um, I think, all like natural coloring, right? And, mm -hmm. um, but, and I, when I think of natural coloring, I think of like super muted, like pastel things, but you, like, they're so vibrant. You found like really fun ways to color all of your curds and your crusts. And um, I just wondered whether you could um, share any fun facts about that or any like discoveries you've had of what's been really cool to work with. Yeah, it's been kind of a fun challenge using only natural coloring. I think artificial coloring will bring you, you know, exact shades of colors that you want. And you're pretty much guaranteed to know that after you bake something or cook something, that color will will retain. Um, but since I pretty much use only fruit powders, vegetable powders, vegetable juices, it's always kind of a gamble of like, what color is this going to turn and will it hold? Um, but it's been really cool to basically my formula for coloring pie dough is just one for one substituting either vegetable juice or fruit juice concentrate 
um, for the water that is typically used in a pie dough formula. And um, yeah, you know, things like spinach juice, blueberry juice, even carrot juice has resulted in some really um, vibrant colored doughs that um, are really fun to play with and design with. And um, a lot of them even bake up really well. So even after being subjected to high heat for over an hour, they come out with um, that coloring still. So that's been really fun. Cool. Okay. So now I want to ask you um, just more about um, your book and the publishing process. And just first of all, wanted to ask whether you ever thought you would be a cookbook author and like how this has all felt, <laughs> I guess. No, never. I could not have imagined any part of my current life um, even, you know, down to living in Seattle. Um, but yeah, I, I guess when my Instagram started taking off, I started getting emails from literary agents and, um, editors and various publishers. And I actually just kind of ignored them for a while because I had no aspirations to write a book. I had no idea how to write a book. I didn't even know what questions to ask. Um, and so just kind of put them off for a little bit until I, you know, a few months had passed and I thought maybe I better follow up and, you know, explore and at least get some more information. Um, so basically I hopped on phone calls with everybody who reached out and then um, confirmed that I probably needed an agent to help guide me through this process. So um, talked to a bunch of them and then picked one um, who I love. My, Catherine is uh, my agent and um, was really integral in helping me develop a proposal, um, which was, you know, the book concept and then putting together this whole package, which she helped me then shop around to publishers. Um, and then we got enough offers for the um, book to go to auction. And then I picked a publisher, picked an editor, signed a book deal, um, and then basically spent all of 2019 working like 16 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week, producing this manuscript. So developing these recipes wow. from scratch, um, coming up with these designs, having my recipe testers uh, test these recipes, reworking them, and then also, you know, writing all the all the other words in between the recipes as well. So it's quite the journey. Um, I think I had a lot of imposter syndrome in 2019 just because I didn't have any sort of publishing experience, had never, obviously never written a book and, you know, didn't have extensive experience developing recipes. Um, so it's, it still feels really exciting to now see my book on shelves and also to see this book in people's homes and see people baking from the book, which has been maybe the best part and to see it on the new york times bestselling list uh, yeah. crazy. i just wanted to ask about like how that felt and like how you found out because that's so cool oh my gosh it was uh wildly unexpected i didn't expect it at all i can't remember it was like an email thread about something else and my editor was like please call me asap so I called her and she was really excited and told me. Um, and then when I got off the phone with her, I just like stood in the living room and screamed really loud, <laughs> um, which is, you know, I, I'm not really a yeller or a screamer. And so Ben comes running out of his office, like, are you OK? And then I'm like, my book just hit the New York Times bestsellers list. And he was actually on a conference call. So everybody in his office could hear <laughs> <laughs> That's um, so it was kind of like we got to celebrate with a lot of people but uh yeah totally wild and crazy and um just you know a note of gratitude to basically everybody who's purchased a copy of the book because that's kind of what gets a book on the list so uh thank you yeah I actually had oh. just a couple more questions about um about the book and that is um kind of who is this book for? Like, do you need to be um, a little bit experienced in pie? Do you, you know, can you be a super beginner? Um, yeah. Yeah, excellent question. The book is for everyone. So um, it was written for professional chefs, uh, home cooks, 
uh, armchair bakers and eaters alike. So whether you're an expert at baking or you're looking to make your first ever pie, um, or you're looking to gift this book to somebody else to make you pie because you enjoy eating it, um, this book has something for everyone. Um, there are recipes for tart shells and pie fillings. There's 50 designs in there and also lots of beautiful photos by Ed Anderson um, with you know step-by-step -step instructions and lots of visuals. So um, whether you learn best by reading instructions or looking at pictures, it's all there. Um, and, you know, it also makes a great coffee table book if you just want to flip through and look at some, you know, really colorful pictures and, you know, they're really beautiful photos that uh, Ed took. So uh, it's really a book for everyone. And I hope people understand that I am a self-taught home baker who was really just puttering around in her home kitchen. Um, so I truly believe that if I can make these pies, anybody can. And now we've made them accessible with all these recipes and instructions. And I, well, I know a lot of um, my friends have gotten it as holiday gifts um, oh, this fun. season. It's really fun. They're like, can she sign it? Um, but uh, <laughs> where can people buy this book? Like, is it in any local bookstores? Um, or yeah, yeah. the book is available everywhere books are sold. Um, I know that there are a lot of local Seattle people tuning in here. So um, uh, stores like Book Larder and The Work Seattle, both are carrying signed books, um, which is fun. So if you're looking to support and shop local and support your indie bookstores, uh, they are good options. But otherwise, the book is available everywhere they're sold. Um, all right, we still have a little bit of time, so I'm going to um, go to my kind of more random questions, um, which is I just wanted to ask you kind of about um, just some of your experiences and getting all of this coverage. And um, you've been featured in really awesome uh, places. Um, I think it was already mentioned you're in Vogue and, you know, tons of magazines and Instagram accounts and NPR. Um, what was one of your favorite features that you um, were a part of? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think being on Martha Stewart's show is, is pretty up there, pretty high up there. I got to fly to New York and go, um, you know, bank in her test kitchen. I felt super out of my league. This was pretty early on in the journey. So I hadn't done a lot of these segments before, but, um, it was pretty crazy to just be like prepping in the test kitchen and have her just like saunter around and like saunter by <laughs> feel like, uh. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Um, most recently, I was on um, NPR's, I, I got to record an episode for NPR's Life Kit podcast. And the host was uh, Shireen Marisol Miraji, which is for me, like, I don't really fangirl a lot, but I listen to a lot of NPR podcasts. And I feel like I've been listening to her for years. So to be able to record something with her and then have her tell me that she like knew about me and you know, had been following my Instagram account is like these experiences will never not be bewildering and really cool to me. So I, you know, I'm just a, still very much a regular person and um, just thinking that my name is out there and people know about my work is, is really cool and really humbling. Kind of on that note, like it, this might be too similar of a question, but is there anyone that you, um, have a, just a really memorable experience in teaching them pie? Um. Oh, good question. Um, I got to do a multi, a series of multi-generational classes on Bainbridge um, a couple of years ago, and I loved that so much. I can't wait to do in-person workshops again, but mostly I can't wait to do little kid classes. So with that class, we had one particular family who they came with a five-year-old, the mom and the grandma flew in from Detroit. Um, and we just, you know, had a bunch of kids who came with their grown up or their adults. And it was just so sweet to be able to, you know, watch them create the signature spoke pie, but also be able to, you know, bake together with their adult. Um, and that was really, really sweet and really fun. And those kind of things are really meaningful to me. So I can't wait until we can all gather in person again so we can do that. Yes. Um, no, it was so fun. You you used to teach a lot of like workshops around Seattle and um, that was really fun. Yeah. 
on. Um, what is a collaboration maybe that we haven't already talked of that you just were really proud to do? Ooh. Um, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking. <laughs> or what is a dream partnership? That's another question. Ooh. Um, I think my like wild dream fantasy for this is to have an interactive exhibit at an art museum. I think that would be really cool. I think I kind of got into this for the art of it and it just so happens that my medium is edible. So I do work really hard to make sure these recipes are um, effective and successful and that these pies taste good, of course. Um, but the designing and the art aspect is my favorite part. So to have an exhibit one day would be like- I feel like that's definitely gonna happen. I can't believe I haven't thought of that. That's, that's like definitely gonna happen. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't think we've talked about Santi yet. We talked about him earlier in another conversation, but um, you have a super cute dog, um, a Sharpe, Sharpe mix. Or he's a Sharpe. He looks like a hybrid of various animals, but he's a Sharpe. And he makes an appearance um, on your Instagram. He makes an appearance in the book. Um, uh, were any of the pies inspired by him? Um, I think I have a head note on my chocolate, malted chocolate banana cream pie that talks about Santi because his favorite food of all time is bananas. Um, and I think it's a little bit ironic that the pie is chocolate since we've had a really crazy last 24 hours in our family because he uncharacteristically got into food that he shouldn't have and consumed a nearly lethal dose of chocolate cookie dough. <laughs> he's alive, he's okay, he's recovering. Um, but yeah, he's a loyal, trusty pal. And as I was developing recipes for this book, he basically just like slept next to me in the kitchen. And then as I was cleaning up, he would just cover up all the crumbs. So um, he's a pretty integral part of this journey. <laughs> he's very, very cute. Um, oh, thanks. We this, think is, so too. this is one of my last questions. Um, but yeah, do you have any, any baking or any pie idols, like, or people that you um, Ooh. just look up to? Um, you know, I think this is one of those funny things. When I first stumbled onto those pictures of pie on Pinterest, um, they were these really beautiful pictures by, or really beautiful pies by women, um, named Joe Harrington and Julie Jones. Um, and then once my account started kind of growing and getting bigger, uh, I guess the, you know, pie community is pretty small. So I am now friends with them, which is pretty crazy. Um, so, you know, I feel like stories like that, where this, this journey has opened up a lot of doors and also facilitated a lot of, you know, connections and new friendships. So, um, I am still a great admirer of their work um, and love and respect what they do. Cool. Um, oh, I do have, a, okay, I have one more question and that is, um, do you have any just pie crust or pie in general, like tips or tricks for the audience um, as they're making pies over the holidays? Um, that, that's really general, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're all in the book. So if you want a deep dive, um, grab a copy of Pyometry. But I think the golden rule of pie making is to keep everything cold at every step. So when you're making your dough, you want your butter to be, I mean, I work with all butter. So you want your butter to be nice and cold, pull it straight out from the fridge. Um, when you're about to roll out your dough, pull it straight out from the fridge, make sure it's nice and cold. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, as you're kind of designing, if you're working with pie dough, if you're doing something a little more intricate, um, I like to do everything on a sheet of parchment so you don't have to worry about your dough melting or sticking to the countertop and ruining your work. Um, and it makes it really easy to pop back in the fridge um, for you to continue working. And, you know, at every step of the process. So once your pie is constructed, I like to freeze my pie solid so it's nice and cold. That helps preserve the sharpness and the integrity of the design as it's baking. Um, and then after you bake it, I know it's no fun, but it's generally recommended for your pie to cool all the way before slicing it. Otherwise it's soup and that way you can get some really pretty slices. So keep things cold. Okay, so I think we're gonna answer some audience questions if there are those yeah. for you. Um, 
let's see. I'm gonna, oh, there we go. Um, how do you balance? How do you balance pastry that is shapeable and beautiful with pastry that is flaky and delicious? Or is that even a choice? Can you do both? Yes, I think you can do both. I think it's important to me to find that balance. Um, as I mentioned, I really love the art and design aspect of it. But of course, I'm working with edible products. I share a lot of what I make with friends, family, and neighbors. So um, one, I don't want to waste food or time. And two, I don't want to feed anybody anything disgusting. So um, yes, it's a definite balance. I like to work with all butter pie dough. Um, because I love the flavor. I think it bakes up into, you know, these beautiful flaky um, layers, has a really great taste. Um, and it's also a little bit more durable than working with something like lard, which I find um, the dough to be a little too tender, too fragile. So for things like, you know, those woven designs or anything that requires a little more handling, um, it, you know, lard doughs are not as good in my experience. So I go with all butter um, and find that that works really well for both flavor and for design durability. Cool. And then Susan is asking, so, um, oh, I'm going to go. I just. It's a test. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. So once we answer a question, it pops off. And so I got confused. But um, let's see. Nope, nope, now it's. Okay. So Susan. Uh, has um, two friends and their daughter in Seattle. Um, she sent your book and okay. they all want to start making pie together, perhaps over Zoom. And so they wanted to know kind of maybe what a starter one would be or start with an easy one first question mark or and what would that be? Yeah, I would say the easiest uh, tart or pie in the entire book is the ice cream one. Um, I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but it's a Funfetti Oreo crust, which is three ingredients. Um, and then you fill it with mint chip ice cream or your ice cream of choice. Um, and then the design is just cutting Andy's mint chocolates to place in a geometric kind of tile design on top. So that one's a great starter um, in terms of like pie pie. There's a spicy maple nut pie in the book. That's really pretty. Um, it, I think I recommend a dragon fruit crust, but you can substitute any sort of pie dough for, you know, other pie dough recipes in the book. Um, and then the design is really cool, but really simple with, you know, arranging pepita seeds and nuts on top. So those are two good starter ones. Um, yeah. Is there one that's like, like harder than the rest that you would not recommend starting with? Um, I wouldn't say I don't recommend. I think that, you know, we've worked really hard to make these recipes accessible and these instructions really clear so that if somebody chooses one that's make, maybe a little more time intensive, um, like one of the woven designs, um, it might just require a little bit more patience and more time. You really want to be committed to, to choosing that design. Um, but I think, you know, if if that's the one that you've committed to, you can do it. I fully believe in you. Okay, Candace wants to know, um, or wants just to know about more of the tools that you use. And are you mm -hmm. using a paring knife or do you have other cutting tools? Have you kind of figured out anything that's great to use? Um, as yeah, I talk about this in the book um, a bit, but uh, my toolkit's actually pretty simple. And I always recommend that people kind of look around their house, look around their kitchen and make do with what they have. When I made my first pie, I had just moved across the country, had um, this tiny apartment. I didn't even have a ruler. So to cut those dough strips, I used a giant cookie sheet and a paring knife, which was a little unwieldy, but it worked. Um, and even if you don't have a rolling pin, if you have a wine bottle or, you know, some sort of round object that you can make do with, um, by all means, um, I do use a pastry roller, a, like a rolling cutter now, and a ruler. It does make life simple, and both of those items are pretty affordable. Um, and then for some of my geometric designs, uh, or, you know, generally designs, I rely heavily on my chef's knife um, and my paring knife. 
Um, so those are things that people probably have in their kitchens. I think the key is to make sure they're nice and sharp. And then if you do want to get a little more specialized, um, I have a set of shape cutters. I think it's maybe six geometric shapes and each shape comes in three different sizes that can kind of cut down the, the time it takes to create some of these repetitive designs where you're not cutting you know, 50 triangles by hand from a kiwi where you can just use the shape cutter to punch them out of fruit or dough. Um, but, you know, otherwise, I don't use a ton of specialized equipment. Um, I don't feel like you have to invest a lot of money in really fancy stuff for this. Um, you know, rolling pin, a, a cheap pie plate that you enjoy using, um, and then a knife are probably the basics that you can do a lot of things with. Awesome. Uh, we have uh, Stephanie asking if you can talk a little bit about tarts versus pies. It's very broad. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly. Yeah, I I feel like the distinction is, is unclear. Um, sometimes people go by the definition that a uh, pie has a top and tarts don't, but then you have things like pumpkin pie or pecan pie um, or, you know, cream pies. Those are still pies. So for me, the way that I've distinguished it in the book is kind of by the like pie pan that I use versus a tart pan. Um, and a lot of my tarts are you bake the shell and you cook the filling separately. And then the design that you lay on top is just fresh fruit. Um, but I think for the most part, it's just kind of the dough recipes and the shell recipes differ, but it's really kind of the equipment, I guess. I use a smaller fluted tart pan for the tart recipes. And then for the pie section, I rely on a like official pie plate, I guess, or pie pan. Awesome. And then um, Megan is asking, do you ever, um, do you see your art ever moving away from pies or um, designing or creating other things? Yeah, uh, I would love to explore other avenues. I just haven't kind of figured out what that might be. Um, I think pie was really having a moment when I first came on the scene and there was still a lot that hadn't been done. Um, and there's things like cakes and cookies where a lot of people have done a lot of amazing things. So I would probably want to find something if I were to transition where there was space still to do, you know, new and original things. But um, I also think I still have a lot of ideas and a lot of designs kind of floating around in my head for pie. So I foresee uh, still a good number of pies and tarts to come. Cool. Uh, Diane wants to know if you have any recipes for savory pies and um, yes. what, what are those or where are those? Yes. Love this question because one of the big ironies of this whole journey is that I don't really have a sweet tooth and I don't love eating pie all that much. Um, and so uh, in our household, we like savory pies the most and those are pretty much the only ones we keep for ourselves. So I made sure to include a number of savory options in the book. Um, there's some there's a turkey pot pie, there's a tomatillo short rib pie with a spinach crust. Um, and there's also this caramelized onion, potato, and Irish porter cheddar tart with an herbed crust that I'm actually not allowed to make that often in this house because we'll just like keep picking at it, keep picking at it, and then eat the entire thing in a day. So um, I make that once in a blue moon because it's too delicious. So yes, lots of savory options. Um, those are my personal favorite. They're, they tend to be a little more work because they require more ingredients and a little more cooking, which is why I don't make them as often. But um, if I were to choose savory or sweet, I am team savory all the way. Um, Stephanie wants to know if you're offering any virtual classes. Oh, the golden question. Um, I have been considering it for pretty much the entire duration of the pandemic and like dragging my feet because I love doing in-person workshops so much and I'm still trying to hold out and hope that we can resume those sooner rather than later, um, which, you know, I don't think it's happening too soon. Um, so I 
am thinking through how to offer virtual classes and how and when I might do that. So stay tuned. I haven't crossed it off my list, um, but I'm still crossing my fingers for resuming uh, in-person workshops, particularly in the new Pastry Project studio that I get to work in. Um, I can't wait to host workshops there. Cool. Okay, someone is asking or saying that when they refrigerate pie dough, it is, um, they find it really hard and difficult to roll. And then if they don't refrigerate it, it's soft and pliable. Um, and just kind of maybe wants to know if there's anything they can do maybe to make it easier to work with, but still keep it cold. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, so obviously I said the golden rule is to keep things cold, but if you can't roll it out, if it's cracking, you can definitely let it sit on your counter to, you know, warm up a little bit. I think the issue is that if it gets like too squishy and your butter starts melting or your whatever fat you're using starts to incorporate too much, then that kind of in turn will make your crust tough when it bakes up. But I think if you're just allowing it to sit for a little bit so that it's easier to roll out then you know that's a great solution okay this question from susan is actually a, it's such a good question i don't know if the answer will like be surprising or not but i have no idea glass pie plate or metal like pie plate? oh can i hold that thought and go back to the last question yes. so i also have seen people make dough and then they roll it out and then they chill it um, so maybe, you know, that's a solution. I've never tried that. I think I prefer to let my dough like rest in the fridge so that the gluten relaxes and forms and all that. And hopefully my recipes aren't resulting in really rock hard discs of dough, but that could be a, a solution where you roll out your dough um, while it's still soft and pliable and then you chill it and let it rest and then you kind of proceed with the process. Um, back to glass or metal. Um, I use both. Um, I prefer them over like the really fancy, beautiful ceramic pie plates. I find that those bake the worst for me. Um, but I pr prefer in a metal pan by USA Pan. It has like a little corrugated bottom um, and find that the pie pies that I bake in those crisp up really well. So no soggy bottoms. Um, and then, you know, those really cheap, basic glass Pyrex pans also work really well. They conduct heat well. And especially if you are um, just starting out on your pie baking journey, those can be a great choice because you can kind of carefully check underneath to see if the bottom is baked through um, and not make that mistake that I did in that one Thanksgiving pie disaster where, you know, I thought it was done, but it really wasn't. So um, I think either or it's really Kind of personal preference. I think they both conduct heat really well. Um, and, you know, both are really affordable options. I, because I give away so many of my pies, I also use a lot of the disposable aluminum foil pie pans. And I think those work really well too. Um, and then just another bonus tip is that sometimes I keep a pizza stone in my oven um, as it heats so that it also directs additional heat to the bottom of your pie to make sure it's nice and crisp. So regardless of what kind of pan you're using, that can be um, another way to ensure against soggy bottoms. Cool. Okay, so we have a question about whether you have a particular type of butter that you would recommend for pie. Oh, um, I'm not very brand specific or loyal and I talk about this in the book I just I'm a regular person shopping at my local grocery stores and on a regular person budget so um, I just kind of buy whatever is on sale um, now since I go through some of so much of it I just buy Costco brand um, like pounds and pounds at a time I keep that in my fridge I think um like the cheap stuff has worked perfectly well for me. So I, I don't necessarily feel the need to splurge. Sometimes I get the nicer stuff um, if I'm, you know, really in the mood or if I have a coupon or if it's on sale. But um, so far, Kirkland brand butter has worked really well for me. Cool. And then I think we only kind of technically Oh, okay. Um, I was going to ask the last question, but now we have a couple more. Um, my lattice is often soggy while the rest of the pie is about to burn. Any suggestions for how to make the top of the pie as beautiful as the inside? Oh, the lattice is soggy. I feel like usually my pie tops 
burn first. Um, so when I bake pies, one, I like to start with them frozen. So they're nice and cold. And then uh, I like to start them at high heat. So I bake them at 425 or 400 for about 20 to 25 minutes. And that will kind of set your design. Um, and then after that point, I'll pull it out and put a little crush shield to protect the edge and then lower the heat to 375 or 400 so that it can slowly continue cooking um, to ensure that the filling cooks all the way through. Um, and then usually I'll check it like every 20 to 30 minutes um, just to make sure that top part isn't getting too burnt or you know, overly cooked. And if it's browning too rapidly, you can kind of rest a sheet of foil on top to protect it and then remove it the last 10 minutes just to make sure it's it's cooked nicely. I think if your lattice is soggy, then maybe it's your like filling is maybe bubbling up and a solution for that is to pre-cook your filling. So for something like really juicy summer berries, um, it can be really useful to kind of cook it in a pan with your thickener. I use tapioca starch until it's like, you know, the consistency that you want and that's bubbling through to make sure that tapioca is cooked all the way through and then fill your pan so you don't run the risk of, you know, overly juicy fruit. I like the blurpage. I think it looks fun and tastes good. So I'm not always worried about that. But if you're finding that um, your fruit has excess liquid, um, cooking it off ahead of time and then filling your pie could, could be something you might want to try. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much wraps everything up. Awesome. Thanks so much for doing this with me. Oh my gosh, this was so much fun. So fun. I hope everyone got to learn so much more about you and your book. Um, it's great. I literally was like reading it just like from front. I mean, it's really entertaining because you put in so many fun oh, little thanks. stories and yeah. yeah, so very fun. Yeah, I hope that comes across. Thanks to everyone for tuning in and for joining and also for following along on this crazy pie journey. I really wouldn't be here if, you know, hundreds of thousands of you guys didn't feel invested and had, you know, some sort of buy-in. So thank you all for your support. Yeah, and on behalf of Town Hall, I just want to thank you both for presenting with us tonight. Um, as I was scrolling through uh, your Instagram, Lauren, one of, that was one of the first things I thought of was these need to be in a museum. They're so they're just so <laughs> beautiful. So I hope that happens. Um, I want to thank the audience as well for watching tonight. Um, I encourage you to buy a copy of Lauren's beautiful book. Um, through the links that you have on your screen here tonight. We're partnering with um, Third Place Books, so uh, check out their site. Um, and yeah, thank you both so much. Hopefully we'll be able to have you in the building sometime soon, whenever we can get back to in-person things. And um, uh, yeah, but I hope you both have a, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks.